are going to move on to the first plenary today, which is the open high-level panel session. The topic of the session is the future of the internet. In this session, we're going to discuss the governance, technology, and security resilience of the future internet from a global perspective. The moderator for the session is Dr. Huang, so I will now hand the floor to Dr. Huang. Okay, thanks again. And let me quickly introduce uh, today's panelists, uh, starting from people on site. Uh, my left hand side will be Akino Risan. He's the uh, Chief Policy Officer of JPNIC, and she was the APNIC Chair and also the ICANN board member before. And next to Akino Rui was Paul Wilson, Director General of APNIC, and also carry quite a lot of position. And is Jeff Houston online? Oh, okay. not yet. Okay, anyway, I'll give an introduction because Joe Hewson right now is in Europe. And Joe Hewson is the chief scientist from APNIC. And he has been published quite a significant amount of discussion and research paper uh, over the internet. A lot of people using the internet, how to protect the internet, also side with his, his publication as well. So from today's uh, discussion, uh, so I'd like to uh, initially invite Akinori giving the initial briefing regarding the future of the internet. Let's welcome Akinori. Oh, sorry, let's welcome Paul Wilson first, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kenny. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, nice to be here with you, Akinori, and hopefully with Jeff uh, as well. I think he's in Europe, so it's uh, some uh, terrible hour um, in um, Rotterdam, I think, where he is. Uh, I'd like to talk uh, this morning for a little while about the future of internet governance because, I mean, I think after all, all of the discussion yesterday about what's What's been happening in the world of, uh, of internet governance and the broader implications of that, I think it's, um, it's really quite important to look at uh, what's coming in the future because there could be quite a lot of changes. I think the internet has got a long way to go. There are many questions still unanswered and, and so we really do have to pay attention to what's, uh, what's going on and make sure that, uh, that the right direction is set by those who are, who are trying to do so. So I'll talk a bit about the, uh, about the history of, of how we got to where we are now and some of the recent um, work that AP Nick has done with some of our, our colleagues on, um, on trying to identify what's, what's been uh, so successful about the internet, you know, trying, trying to inform with some concrete technical uh, inputs, uh, some concrete technical conclusions, uh, trying to inform that discussion so that we can try to, try to avoid um, making mistakes by uh, by overlooking, uh, taking for granted, or, or even damaging the, the sort of positive aspects of the internet, the, the very specific positive aspects which have, um, which have brought us to where we are today and which will uh, continue uh, into the future and, and bring more success into the future if we, if we make sure that they're uh, preserved. A bit of, of prehistory here. I'm really going to be talking, as I said yesterday, internet governance only started uh, to be really debated uh, 20 years ago, but in fact, um, what you see here is a sort of prehistory of, of internet governance. I mean, the, inter the internet has been coordinated, it's been governed, it's been designed and managed ever since it started. And this timeline goes back uh, not to the very beginning, but to one milestone, which is in 1983, that uh, IPv4 was adopted and officially deployed as the protocol for the internet, IPv4. And so that was courtesy of the IETF, which was designing the protocols. And it was, it was followed fairly rapidly by, um, by actually pretty m massive growth in the internet that was starting to happen in the early 90s. And it, um, it resulted through community processes, through the, the governance processes as they existed. It, it actually resulted in the creation of, um, of several important organizations, including APNIC the, that I represent preceded um, shortly by, by RIPE NCC as the first of the independent regional internet registries, then APNIC. ARIN was, uh, was established out of the, um, out of the earlier um, internet that, that ran the, the global uh, allocations of addresses. Uh, and then by ICANN in, um, in around 1999, LACNIC, NRO, AFRINIC, all of this happened 
as part of governance processes that were, were existing through this entire period. And yet it was actually about 20 years ago with this uh, World Summit on Information Society that um, because governments started to see the importance of the internet, uh, you know, govern governments uh, like to govern and they, um, they ask the question, who is governing the internet? That's the, the, the key question on the minds of gov governments. And they commissioned a working group which came up and identified the multi-stakeholder model, identified that the reason why the internet was so successful, and this was 20 years ago, mind you, the internet was relatively small back then, uh, 20 years ago, they realised that the success came from this multi-stakeholder process, without the multi-stakeholder process that had existed and that, that had actually uh, driven and under, underpinned internet governance uh, up until that point, the internet would have been very different. There was a lot of focus back then on ICANN. ICANN was quite new and it, it took uh, responsibility for addressing and naming. And uh, that was also a, a very unique uh, sort of situation as far as governments were con concerned. So they were, were very interested and some governments were not entirely happy, uh, possibly still aren't entirely happy with the, with the arrangements that existed and have, have continued to exist. Um, but actually, uh, with the ongoing demonstrable success of that, of that process. You know, the, the internet has continued to run and it's continued to do its job in spite of, in spite of any doubts about these things. The focus came away from um, ICANN addressing domain names and so on, not to say they're being ignored, but, but over time, a whole lot of other things have, have happened around um, developing principles and norms and deci decision-making processes. The, a lot of things have been developed and proposed to, to try to sort of um, guarantee in some people's minds the, the shape of regulation and, and use of the internet in, into the future. One, one or two practical things have happened over that time, because there's been a lot of talk, but one or two practical things have happened within the existing multi-stakeholder model, and that was the IANA stewardship transition. So finally, although ICANN was established with a goal to transition completely into the into private hands by no later than September 30th, 2000. It still took 16 years, but um, finally it was uh, successful that um, the IANA stewardship transition happened in 2016, 16 years later, as a result of a, quite a complex global multi-stakeholder process or set of processes that produced a, a good result that was agreed by consensus of, of all of those communities. And that really was a case of multi-stakeholder, <coughs> excuse me, internet governance in action. But, you know, over, over 20 years, uh, the, <coughs> the internet has continued, as I said, <coughs> excuse me, um, it has continued and it's been very successful. So in, in 20 years, we've gone from less than a billion to more than five billion users of the internet. Um, the Asia Pacific region in particular has grown, has grown massively, but even though those other regional lines you see there uh, sort of relatively flat compared with the, when you look at the numbers of users, we all know how much more important, how much more active uh, the internet has become and how much more pervasive through our lives. So there's 20 years of success under the current internet governance uh, model and that's really, really undeniable. So the question is what brought us here and how is it that, that the internet has been so successful? There's been a lot of a lot of talk about it, there's been a lot of description of the internet, there's been a lot of kind of ideology about the internet, which has been very important. It's the sort of things that, um, that we spoke about yesterday in the, the open end-to-end uh, -end, uh, global model of the internet, all very good. Um, but also, as I mentioned yesterday, there have been a lot of compromises there. So the ideals haven't always been met. Um, so you can't say that the, the internet is purely an end-to-end -end network, because as I, as I pointed out yesterday, the um, that's actually not the case and for very good reason. So there still are, there must be some other factors. There must be some sort of core factors. And, and APNIC and LACNIC uh, got together actually during the COVID years and commissioned a report on the technical success factors of the internet. And I want to, I want to um, go through those because these are the things that in more detail have a real bearing on the future of the internet. They're the things that we, we need to recognise and really detail and understand and, and make sure that they continue in, into, the, into the future. So this study found um, four dimensions of, of success of the internet. Um, and they are shown in the, in the centre circle there that the internet is um, 
flexible it, and specifically it runs, it is, is able to adapt to new technologies, new underlying technologies to provide its services. It's adaptable to provision of, of more and more and different applications. It's scalable in usage and, and in users and it's resilient. And these are the, the four dimensions of success that were, uh, that were identified by this study. Now moving back from there, the reasons why, they come from uh, design principles and guiding ideals. And the study determined that the guiding ideals of the internet, now these, these are the things, as I said, idealistically, they're the things that were, were seen by and identified by and preserved by the earliest uh, designers of the internet, the openness of the internet, the simplicity of the internet, the decentralization of the internet. No one, in fact, in charge of every aspect of the internet was, was a, a kind of a governance principle back in, the, back in the early days, but along with simplicity and openness. And these, these guiding ideals led to design principles, and these are technical design principles that the internet would be a layered model now that's not a new, a new thing at the time. There are all sorts of complex layered models being, being discussed and designed um, at the time. But the internet's model was, was chosen as a, as a layered model and a, and a simplified one compared with uh, alternatives at the time. The internet would be designed as a network of networks. So the openness of the internet uh, implied that um, networks could come along and join the network, join the internet without uh, sort of being centrally controlled or um, centrally gated to, to, to come in. And then also that the internet would, um, would provide, no matter how many networks uh, joined the internet, it would provide an end-to-end -end connectivity between any point on the existing internet, any point on a, on a new network that, that joined. These are sort of um, well-known principles in, in general. Um, we talk about a lot about these, but I think the point of this study was to really crystallize and identify that we have these four dimensions of success. They come from quite specific design principles led by uh, guiding ideals. None of this has, has changed. Uh, the, the design principles sort of, uh, which come out of, the, uh, out of the, um, these ideals, they, they create uh, what's illustrated here as uh, the network of networks, numerous networks joined, uh, connecting users across applications uh, according to the end-to-end -end principle and the layering of that model allows it to be um, both uh, flexible and adaptable as new underlying layers are developed and new applications can be, can be laid on top. And so there's some more, um, and there's quite a bit of detail here, so <clears throat> excuse me, I won't, um, I won't go into all of this in the interest of time in, in detail, but I would uh, recommend you to the study, which uh, I'll, um, I'll include the URL uh, by the end. Point is, scalability has allowed this incredible growth in internet usage and users. So as, as I mentioned before, the, in some parts of the world, it might, might look like the internet's users haven't grown astronomically over the last, over that period, but the usage of the internet has grown ast astronomically. So it's about the scalability of the technical architecture, the operational and the business models that have allowed that to happen. <clears throat> and that's allowed this um, incredible uh, geographic reach of the internet, particularly as, as you saw in the, in the Asia Pacific region. We're going to see that more in Africa as, um, as Africa um, comes more up to speed in the next decade, I'm sure, to show that the scalability of the internet will become truly global. Now, flexibility is that idea that the internet protocols, the the, the idea of the internet, the, the core protocols of the internet run over many different, different technologies. And, and it's really fascinating to look at this graph since uh, the year 2000, where there have been so many different technologies that have come along. They've dominated the, the internet in terms of the carriage that's delivered the internet to the end user, but they've changed, cha they've changed dramatically. They've come and gone. So we had, we had analog um, mechanisms, we've had DSL that came along to lie on top of those analog, um, the, the telephone line in particular, uh, DSL came and went. Um, mobile wireless has gone, has gone pretty ballistic and has stayed up there. Uh, fiber, of course, and, and others have come and, and gone. And so these underlying networks, uh, they come and go, but the internet still exists. You know, the, end, the end user, apart from improvements in 
say, speed and reliability, they get to do exactly the same thing with the internet, and that's a, that's a pretty phenomenal uh, result of the layered model that, it, that exists. And, and uh, the, the independence of those layers, the ability for new layers to be developed, to be deployed locally or globally, to, to succeed or to fail for that matter, uh, really um, is, is maximised without, um, without affecting the internet's um, integrity itself. Adaptability goes the other way. It's about the internet providing service to the upper layers. And so again, we see um, so many changes in those upper layers. We see uh, website traffic and applications. So this, this, this graph only goes back to 2018, actually. So you see some very large growth just in the last five years uh, in, in that the internet can support new applications that are continually emerging. So the layering and the end-to-end -end principle, the fact that these, these applications can simply rely on the fact that they can reach and connect any point on the internet to any other point on the internet. It, an application doesn't have to reinvent that idea because the internet provides it. And that's what allows the, uh, the new applications to come along. The, the internet is endlessly adaptable to those new applications. Now, there are some dependencies. So we all know about IPv6, and, um, and unless we do deploy IPv6, the adaptability of the internet can really be threatened because what we want to have is a, is a network of many, many billions, even hundreds of billions of devices that can connect to each other in the same old way as the internet has, has always provided with IPv4, but we know that with IPv4 that's not going to be possible. So really we've got to, we've got to get moving uh, on, on the internet layer in order for that adaptability to be, to be pr preserved. But that's quite a simple uh, prospect. It's an easy decision at a technical and a governance level to sort of say that's our, that's our goal. Maybe a bit, a bit more difficult to actually implement it, but, uh, but the point is it's, um, it's not a complex thing. The resilience of the internet, I mean, we look at the bandwidth of the internet uh, throughout the world, the increases of bandwidth fourfold, uh, as shown here in the last um, seven, or so, seven or so years. The fact that it has been able to extend so much to different usages, to different applications, to carry that traffic, to meet that demand, is, is really about the resilience of the, of the structure itself. You know, it, it, um, it hasn't collapsed, uh, hasn't come, come close to collapse. During this, um, during this entire period in spite of these incredible uh, figures which uh, really should, should represent some serious growth pains if you, if you like uh, to any, any other system. Now all of, all of this leads, does lead to uh, quite a bit of, of uh, tension. The, the success of the internet has created internet giants. The success of the internet has created a huge dependency and a very big question mark over the internet for gov governments. So, the point here is simply that as this, as this um, does continue, this is where we're seeing the tension actually happening. So I've, I've sort of moved on here from those technical aspects, which are pretty plain and simple, uh, very good to identify and to preserve, but, but now we're reaching into what are the, the actual implications in terms of governance from this point onwards. And there's, there's a lot of tension. We're seeing um, that internet governance, as we heard yesterday, it's, it's become a political uh, a political activity with a technical component rather than vice versa, and it's become uh, more uh, critically multilateral than multi-stakeholder. I don't say I don't say critically because somehow that's that's more important or, sh or it should be overarching, but it's uh, it's an area of of higher risk, higher attention, higher uh, complexity. So. Uh, these, these models uh, have worked kind of independently as the internet has grown, but, but definitely the, the multilateral um, components are coming very solidly into the, into the world of internet governance. So we did have the transition of internet of IANA functions. It was a very good example, um, but there's a, there's a need for a lot more to come from the multi-stakeholder community to respond to this multilateral pressure to, um, to uh, prevent fragmentation of the internet, as we discussed um, yesterday, and bring together a lot of disparate processes. So here's a bit of a timeline, um, sort of colour-coded between the, the UN processes which have been going on. They, they, um, they initiated the WSIS back in 2020, the World um, Conference on uh, International Telecommunications, uh, the, the plenipotentiary meeting of, of last year. These were big international events which threw a huge spotlight onto the internet. 
Luckily, uh, WISIS back in 2005 did, did recognise the multi-stakeholder model and it, it went on into the IGF process. Uh, it's coming up to something called WISIS Plus 20 in 2025, which is another big decision point where, where the governments of the world, uh, primarily the governments of the world in spite of the, the, the lip service given to multi-stakeholder multi-stakeholderism, will be making some big decisions about whether or not, for instance, the IGF will continue. The UN ha has also undertaken several other uh, pretty important processes that what's called the, the Global Group of Experts and the Open End Working Group. The, meanwhile, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, we've got the IANA, uh, the IANA transition into ICANN, the ICANN transition into, into multi-stakeholder oversight, the RIRs continuing. Uh, on the, on the right-hand side is, is another initiative which, which came up a few years ago, which was the World Internet Conference out of Wuxian in, uh, in Beijing. All of these things are going on, and I don't think, uh, notwithstanding IGF, I don't think any of these things are going to, going to come to an end. They're going to continue and maybe be joined by more and more processes. So if we scroll up a little bit and we ask the question about what will happen with any of these processes, they're all more or less uh, in doubt. I mean, the future is, un, is unpredictable. I'm not saying that uh, RIRs, for instance, are fundamentally in doubt, but, but all of this is really in the future, and I think what we've got to um, what we've got to be looking forward to here is not a, diver a divergence of, of all of these activities, but a convergence into something that's more that's harmonious, that's interoperable, that uh, recognises the strengths and the the importance of many, if not all, of these processes, and um, and moves on towards um, an internet that. Um, will give us uh, more of the same. Someone said yesterday that, um, that it's, a bit, it's a bit boring sometimes to just uh, to not have uh, the next new thing, whether it's blockchain or AI, we're always looking for something new. Sometimes I feel like in this internet community we're just asking for more of the same, but we actually are, because unless we have more of the same, the success of the internet as it, as it exists, unless we recognise what it brings us and how we can protect and continue it, then a lot of the other new stuff, which other people sort of seem to want to have all the time, it, it, these these, uh, these new things are not really going to be delivered in the same in the same way or with the same potential. So, I do uh, refer you to the report. Um, it came from Analysis Mason, a, a, a global uh, consulting uh, firm. Uh, they did a lot of work into this thing. It's called the the study on internet success factors, and uh, and I'd really. Um, recommend you take take a look at that because it's got a lot more of what uh, what I've spoken about here. So that's that's all from me. I hope that's useful for the discussion. And uh, if there's any questions and discussions, very very happy to participate uh, in the session. Thanks. Oh, yeah, please come back in. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I just a very simple reminder to 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 the panelists uh, because not. I'm not sure whether the audience that uh, they have all have very comprehensive technical background, and they probably not a uh, very technical background compared to APNIC or ITM meeting. So if we cover some sort of acronym, probably a little bit uh, introduction will be will be much better to the audience. And the next one will be the uh, Jeff Houston, but uh, I just got a notice that Jeff are unable to to join online uh, since it's midnight in Europe. Besides, Australia has very strict labor law, so we wouldn't bother to, to call him right now. But fortunately, he has a pre-recorded video, so can we switch to Jeff Houston recorded video? Thank you. Hello, my name is Jeff Houston. I'm the Chief Scientist at uh, APNIC. And uh, today I would like to talk about a subject that I think has been a constant factor of the internet since its inception, which, you know, dates back over 50 years these days. And that topic is resilience. How do you create a service that can survive across disruption, across efforts that try to break it, um, whether it's accidental or deliberate? How do you create a service that survives? And, and that's actually quite a, a tricky problem. So today, let's go into that in little detail and explore some of the ways the internet has, has tried to design itself around that and create reliable outcomes. And then after looking at how it does it, 
I'd like to look at some of the practical limits on how good you can make this system. What are these limits in trying to engineer resilience into something like the internet? Um, so let's start all the way down in the protocol stack, all the way down at the basic level of transmission. Now, if you and I string up, literally a string between you and I, if someone comes along and snips that string, we've got a problem. And certainly, wherever you have single points of connection, you have a potential problem, a single point of failure, a point of vulnerability. And so when we start looking right down the bottom of the protocol stack at the point-to-point -point transmission connections that we use to build a network, then I think the important principle there, and there's a principle we've known for, I suppose, hundreds of years, is don't use single points of failure. Always try and figure out an internal mesh of connectivity such that every single nodal point that connects individual links connects at least to two or more other nodes. And here on, on this slide, I've shown a picture of the major trunk cable conduits in the United States. And, and the red points are the junction points where this long distance network interconnects into local reticulation points. And with a number of small exceptions, you actually find that most of this system is phenomenally redundant. Um, up in the Northeast, where there's a high population center, there is a high inter-trunk circuit capacity density. But that band over in the left-hand side of the country, where the Rockies are, the high mountains, you actually find that there are four paths across those mountains, one north, two central, and one south. And if any single one of those links was to fail, there is enough connectivity within the system that overall the system will still work. As you see, there are a very small number of points connected by only one nodal system uh, in, the, in the center of the country by the look of it. But the rest of the case, everything is connected to at least two others. And, and that way, it's not susceptible to individual failure. But that's quite not enough because you also need a control system that sits on top of that underlying connectivity that is constantly looking at itself, that is looking for failures in that internodal network. And if failures occur, shut down the use of that part of the network and redirect data flow around it to go to somewhere else. Now, that was on land. What do we do about at sea? And I suppose the answer is almost the same, almost the same. And if you look at any uh, map of undersea cable systems, and here's one from Telegeography, you see that between the major points of population and business, there is a rich set of connections between them. Now, what that means, for example, is that no single cable can become a single point of vulnerability. But to some way, I think that glosses over some more trickier constraints um, that actually sit in the submarine cable system. There are a very small number of landing points, uh, in particular on the um, east coast of the United States. A large number of cables come into one point, and if there is wet and stormy weather in the Atlantic that hits the coastal eastern US, uh, those landing points are at risk. Over in Asia, there is a major connection point just south of the island of Taiwan in the, um, in the strait down there, the Luzon Strait, and submarine landslides have managed to take out, I think, up to 30 cables about 10 years ago. Um, and because geography says there are very few ways to get from east to west other than going through that strait, geography actually reinstalls single points of vulnerability. The other part about this is that most of these cable systems are independent of all the others. They're all individual ventures. And so mutual backup, mutual redundancy relationships with these cable systems is not necessarily a feature. And that when a cable goes down, it's almost left to the customers to go and figure out how to restore their communications needs because if the cable's down, the cable isn't going to help you anymore. 
So with some caveats, and I suppose it's a sparser mess is the best way to describe it, the submarine cable system has some elements of resilience and redundancy, but it is a more limited form when everything is under your control within a country, within a geographic you know, land mass. What if we look up? Um, then we actually get again a very interesting picture because this is a map here of, of SpaceX services. And uh, as you see, with up to 4,000 individual satellites at just 550 kilometres up there, um, these compound systems are very, very dense. Almost anyone on any part of the Earth's surface can look up and not just see one of these satellites zooming across the sky, but a number of them in almost in parallel. So no single satellite is actually critical. And indeed, satellites do have their mishaps, failures, they burn up, etc. And the satellites that are surrounding them in these low Earth orbiting systems can effectively take their place. No single satellite is a critical point of failure. No single satellite is vital to the entire service. It can mutually heal. It's not quite the same story if we go higher in altitude. The mid-level um, Earth orbits, MEOs, and the higher geostationary Earth orbits, GEOs, um, are not in a dense mesh. Um, and they generally, generally don't offer mutual backup. But it's not quite as stark as it might seem because such services can be used to complement existing Earth-based systems, submarine fibre, et cetera, and complement them by offering a space-based path as a backup. And one could even envisage, and who knows, it might be being used right now, the low Earth systems close to Earth are effectively a backup against the transmission systems from the geostationary in higher altitudes and vice versa. So at the transmission level, we've actually managed to gird the entire Earth, land and sea, and space in a rich and dense mesh of connectivity. And to a certain extent, we have been able to create a huge amount of resilience in transmission as long as you're prepared to go down all paths at the same time. So the issue comes, how do you actually detect and repair such transmission systems? When they become, you know, dud, when they fail, how do you redirect the data flows along these new paths? This was always a major problem for the telephone network because those stateful virtual circuit systems, circuit systems have a really challenging task because when you get failure, you have to reload that circuit state into all of the remaining forwarding systems, all the remaining nodes. And that is both complex, time consuming and not very reliable. Is there another way? And that's a question that dates back to the 50s. When we started looking, instead of doing virtual circuits in our communication systems, start putting a little bit more functionality into individual packets and use a packet forwarding design that doesn't rely on a preloaded state for each virtual circuit sitting inside the network. Stateless packet switching is more resilient. And in essence, that's the underlying architecture of the internet itself by allowing every node a greater ability to determine how to handle, you know, how to move packets towards their destination and effectively don't impose state in the network itself, you can get much, much more responsive systems that can actually heal against many forms of individual node and link failure. And this was the work started in the early 60s about trying to construct a resilient and reliable system on top of components that individually are a lot less reliable and can and will fail. But the system itself can detect and heal across that failure. And, and that's, I suppose, the essence of packet networking and the reason why there is resilience in these systems. You divide each, net, each communication stream into a sequence of packets, put the destination uh, address in the header of the packet, put a sequence number, and just send the packets into the network. 
In a datagram network, every packet is its own experience. It may or may not get through. It's an independent transaction. There may be loss. There may be reordering. But as long as you've got sequence numbers, as long as the network delivers some packets, then you can reassemble the original communication stream. By looking at the sequence numbers as you receive packets, you can tell which are out of order. And by using timers, you can tell which ones have been dropped. And as long as you have some mechanism to say, I drop packet number three, or sequence numbers between this number and that, resend the data, please. Then in actual fact, you can build reliable communication services above a much less reliable datagram forwarding network. And, and that is essentially what the internet is. Now, there's a second part to this, which is actually loading up each element of the switching system in a datagram network with enough information to understand how to get individual packets to their destination and do it without creating circuits. And what we use is routing, the routing technology, but it's a very special form of technology because it's a so-called distributed computation. There's no routing arbiter. There's no routing boss. Those individual switching elements are all peers of each other. And the distributed computation is such that they all run the same algorithm, the same program. And so doing, the outcome is that every node in this topology knows where all the destinations are relative to itself. If I'm in Utah, and I want to go to California, send the packets to the left. If I want to go anywhere else, send the packets to the right. And in this NSFnet topology of from around 1993, sending right actually had two subparts. If the packet was destined to address somewhere up in the northeast, send it directly to Michigan. If it's in the center or the south, send it to Colorado. So a bunch of local decisions about local forwarding generated from a routing system that actually works without overall control or overall orchestration. Every router is running the same routing algorithm. And interestingly, this system can detect failure and self-heal without any sort of manual or overriding system uh, to control it. There's no single point of failure in routing. It is just a distributed algorithm. We can go further up the protocol stack and see resilience at the next level up. Because while that thing about routing and transmission works in long distance trunking, when I'm a customer attached to the network, how do I create a reliable and resilient service? How can I, if you will, create a service that is more reliable than the ISPs I might use for connectivity? And the basic answer is get two ISPs, get three, get more allow them to back each other up so that you as an endpoint connect to multiple providers at the same time. Now, as long as you've got the luxury of your own address space, you can announce this address space to each and every of your multiple providers and you get them to announce their reachability back to your site. This way, if any individual provider fails, that failure will be noticed by a lack of routes being presented to you. And you can automatically switch over and use your backup or your alternate provider in the case of failure of one of them. So as long as you've got the luxury of your own addresses, you can implement highly reliable edge systems through the technique known as multi-homing. Now, V4 is the normal way we do this these days. Multi-homing in V4, get your own addresses, connect up, put a, a, a router or set of routers using router redundancy protocol and do it that way. But in IPv6, instead of sending your addresses to everyone else, we were trying to conserve some of the pressure on the routing system. And we thought, well, what if you actually get a prefix from each of your providers so that you're not putting another entry in the routing system, can you still do reliable multi-homing when you're using multiple addresses? Now, V6 had thought of that in its basic design. And V6 hosts are actually able to have multiple V6 addresses on its network interfaces. 
This is good. This is the essential building block that we can build resilience. But how? Because when you change IP addresses, that doesn't necessarily mean your session is going to stay up. And we try in the IPv6 working groups with a protocol called SHIM6, which was actually a strange form of address translation protocol, but inside the stack. So that in essence, the application and the transport system could see a single constant external address. But if it needed to switch providers because there was some failure, it would switch the source address of the packets it was sending to use a different you know, network service provider in the V6 transit network. Rather clever. Did it work? Well, yes and no. It was certainly a viable technology, but commercially out there in the big world of V6, never been taken up. In some ways, network failure was meant to be treated by network operators. Getting hosts to be resilient was thought to be a different problem. So instead of doing the host issue of resilience at the IP level, we've actually gone and taken the host resilience upper level into transport. Now, TCP itself is a highly reliable protocol. It incorporates loss recovery, rate adaptation as the basic part of protocol operation. But if you look at your mobile phone, you might find cellular radio and Wi-Fi, multiple interfaces. And oddly enough, when you walk out of Wi-Fi range, your cellular radio doesn't keep open the same sessions. You have to stop and restart. But do you have to stop and restart? There was a wonderful approach called multi-part TCP, where if I had multiple network interfaces, I could use all of them at once to talk to you. And in essence, switch my data between those multiple paths in the network if one or the other was either not working or I had a policy that said, whenever there's Wi-Fi, use it because cellular radio costs me more money. And indeed, some bits of Apple, I think it was Siri was the application, actually came up and used multi-path TCP by default. So that if you started a session on cellular and Wi-Fi got into range, Siri would just automatically use it. Quite inventive. Has it taken off? I think the best answer is, not yet. We're still waiting. Um, there's another form of this, which is in the newer TCP protocol, TCP-like, called Quick, where Quick actually allows for address agility. That if I'm running, say, through a NAT, and my address changes because the NAT rebinds, then I can tell the other end, hey, I've just changed source address. Use a new address to reach me for the return packets. And it actually is survives a session, a quick session, across NAT rebinding, host address rebinding, and even potentially in terms of multi-homing, address rebinding through multi-homing. So Quick again, has incorporated this model that it's not the addresses that form the connection. It's actually an encrypted state, a session token. Where did Quick get this from? Well, I suspect it got it from an earlier protocol called the Host Identity Protocol that used a cryptographic key as a sort of a similar concept of how to bind a session to this token, allowing the addresses to assume a more fluid characteristic. But it's not just transport. We do this at the application level, almost commonplace. Any glance at the DNS would see massive redundancy, multiple name servers, multiple recursive resolvers, multiple IP addresses for each of your address resource records, and an approach from the client that says, keep on querying, just keep on querying until you get an answer. Expand your query set until somebody answers. The DNS will keep on working where all other things have long since failed and given up because of that massive concentration of effort and design in the DNS of effectively resilience, the ability to actually discover paths at work when many others don't for whatever reason. We're also now discovering this in services and the latest work, and it's been about the last 10 years in so-called Anycast networks, where the same address point is actually announced at multiple points in the network. So you can actually get to the same address 
in many ways. And the root service system of the DNS is a good example of one of the earlier large-scale users of any cast. So in essence, the routing system tells you where the closest one is. Google.com is any cast. A whole bunch of services, Microsoft.com, etc., have gone into cloud-based systems. And the way cloud-based systems work in general is to actually use this concept of any cast that you replicate the service at multiple points on the network and use the routing system to get you to the fastest one. But if it fails, the routing system will seamlessly repair that and send you to another instance of the same service. And you can make those anycast clouds larger or smaller without necessarily disrupting the service as a whole. So we've made massive steps in this. It's now possible to sort of thought about what are the features of resilient engineering to avoid single points of critical failure? Over-engineering, flexible service overlays with dynamic reconfiguration, and feedback. Know when things are dead so that you can actually allow for the healing system to actually repair the errors. And just a few tiny comments about how far we've got and whether it's the same place because it certainly looks like every part of the protocol stack has tried to address resilience in its own way. Are we doing too much? Is this kind of random respond to resilience at every level just too big a response? Do we trip over each other? I suspect not. I suspect they're all responding to different kinds of potential failure modes. And depending on whether you've got circuit failure, reachability failure, application failure, you actually get different kinds of responses at different parts of the protocol stack. There is a one part that is kind of different to the old phone system, and is, is resilience reacting too slowly these days? When we built the phone system using the synchronous digital hierarchy and the so-called rings, they were promising a 50 millisecond reaction time to primary path failure. Seamless healing in phenomenally short time. Our routing protocol, BGP, on average takes, well, 50 seconds. Not milliseconds, 50 seconds, a thousand times slower. Even the DNS might take up to eight seconds to find a responding service because of all those searches. Is this too slow? Should we look not only at resilience, but faster recovery as our future target? But if I'm talking about performance targets, what are they? What are we trying to engineer the system to actually behave at? What's the time level to detect and heal from some kind of disruption? What are the costs of re resilience and who pays are all remarkably good questions. And I'm not sure I understand the answers or anyone else. And, and, and last and not least, is it possible to re position resilience as a competitive differentiator? I'm a highly resilient ISP. I charge more, but I offer a more reliable service versus someone who doesn't. And, and the answers are kind of cloudy. Yes and no. At some elements of the protocol stack, resilience is a lot easier for an individual ISP to work. But in other cases, it's actually left to the host or the application to actually perform that resilience. And they assume all the service providers who are providing service are equally unreliable. And so in some ways, they don't differentiate between lower levels of variable resiliency. They just assume the worst case all the time. So in finally, and in conclusion, it's certainly true that the internet was designed and does support a highly resilient service. But to make it work as intended, everyone needs to do their part. Don't build in single points of failure. Provision infrastructure with redundant capacity and avoid imposing state on your service. If you follow that mode and if you follow that form of operation, then you're actually able to operate an internet service with an astonishing degree of resilience against various forms of failure, accidental or imposed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jeff, although he couldn't hear here. And just final reminder, because 
Uh, I'm not sure whether all our audience are really technical comprehension with a very sufficient technical service. So please, uh, the panelists uh, just simply explain if there's any special technical term or any acronym, a little bit reminder will be better to the audience. Okay, thanks again for, for Jeff's uh, presentation. Let's switch it back to, to Akinori. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I've got one, one page slide, but it is uh, projected later, please. Not now. Thank you very much, though. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the, uh, this uh, remarkable event, uh, you know, uh, I can lay back. Uh, TWNIC uh, Engagement Forum, and then I'm really glad to be back here uh, in Taipei uh, to see the, the local friend here uh, after the three years absence. That's uh, too long for me. <laughs> and then I, I miss missed Taipei a lot, and then I am now regaining that. And uh, that's, uh, I'm really, you know, thrilled to be uh, in, 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 the, in the stage uh, between, uh, you know, Jeff Houston and Paul Wilson and Kenny Huan, their giant. And then I, I have been wondering what should I present to in, in front of you and, uh, you know, in front of uh, the, uh, the, the audience. But uh, I have my own take. Um, that's the, the Paul, uh, Paul's uh, presentation was quite, uh, you know, comprehensive to describe the current situation of the internet, and then in in uh, in, uh, in uh, recognition of the history, and then uh, uh, of the internet, that's uh, you know really uh, you know tells a lot. And then uh, Je uh, Jeff's presentation, uh, his the theme was the resilience, but it is uh, quite uh, you know pretty much pretty much based on uh, the internet uh, principles, internet architectures, and then uh, I. I am, I am these days, uh, you know, uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of chances to, uh, to review the history. And uh, the one, of the, one of them is the, a short history of the internet, uh, which is authored by the, the internet giant and then uh, publicized in the ISOC webpage. And then uh, that's, that's actually, uh, you know, the, written by uh, the, the Windsurf and then the... Uh, Tim Bernalee, such kind of the quite frontier of the internet, and then uh, I am, uh, you know, quite uh, quite impressed that uh, uh, the internet uh, in uh, in the beginning is the uh, you know uh, try to interconnect a lot of networks, uh, including the packet radio. Then you know, packet radio meaning that you know the uh, packet communication over the radio channel. That that that's that is a totally different from the terrestrial line, the circuit, uh, circuit communication in terms of the, uh, the delay and then uh, the, the bandwidth. So uh, the, the circuit, uh, uh, wire the circuit communications and the radio uh, communications uh, are, are totally different in the characteristics. And they are to be interconnected, meaning there is a lot of, a lot of uh, there, need, there need to be a lot of effort to buffering and then uh, you know taking a pace to be interconnected so uh, i i think i think it is uh, quite uh, you know the representation of the how uh, internet is uh, you know the focused on the interconnecting a lot of thing and then a layered network uh, on the quite different uh, the types of the the networks so uh, it is one of the uh, you know the wisdom of the, the internet frontiers, uh, which is uh, now now we 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 all uh, we meaning the the people uh, using or people operating the internet, the entire internet people are you know, enjoying uh, this this wisdom of the pioneers. So uh, this is the. Uh, you know, uh, we are, so uh, in, in that in the term, I am quite, you know, uh, I like to uh, follow and uh, I like to learn from the history. Then now, uh, the, the, the session, of, uh, the, the theme of the session is the future of the internet. Then <laughs> it's a quite a, the big word, isn't it? The, but uh, the, the future of the internet is only uh, be, uh, be considered 
uh, based on the, the, the current internet and then uh, based on the, the history of the internet. Then uh, the, there's, uh, there's, uh, one, uh, there's my three thoughts uh, recently uh, when, I, when I think about the internet. So uh, the, uh, I, I, I will present three points uh, for the f future of the internet. And then maybe this is uh, more, you know, I, I, I expect very much uh, on the internet, but still have a lot of concern uh, on, the, on the internet. So this, uh, these three points are the rather, maybe it's a concern, uh, that they are, they are concerns of, my, uh, of mine uh, for the future of the internet. And then uh, uh, my, uh, my presentation, my speech is not, not too long, and then uh, we may, we will have uh, the plenty of time for the discussion, so please, uh, let's have it discussed. The first thing is that the, uh, we have the uh, explicit need of the robust internet coordination institutions. Uh, this is, this is uh, I, I, I think that many of you uh, is finding uh, what I am, uh, I, I am uh, talking about. Uh, that is, uh, the, for example, in, uh, in uh, the previous APNIC uh, Executive Council election, we have uh, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, what is it, substantial abuse uh, to, the, to the election process. And then uh, th there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, violation of the code of conduct. But we don't, uh, uh, APNIC uh, was not able to uh, ban and then uh, disqualify that uh, that uh, that uh, uh, candidate, and then uh, that's that's actually you know we really uh, really simply saying that this this kind of the attack is now being put to the to the uh, internet coordination institutions. So that that is uh, that this concern is uh, the very reason why that JPNIC uh, made uh, made up with the, the appeal uh, for the APNIC to be to reinforce the. The, the, its, uh, its governing mechanism to be to be much more robust, and then uh, another another example is the Afrinic. Uh, it is uh, not to be hidden. It is uh, already uh, quite quite told uh, in uh, uh, the multiple multiple articles, and then uh, it is obvious. For example, that one one of the obvious thing is that uh, if you if you check up the the member uh, member list of the uh, number number council of the NRO or address council of the ASO, you will find that uh, the, there is a, a one uh, only one Afrinic uh, the, the member from the Afrinic. Uh, that is reason, uh, that is because now the Afrinic has some uh, malfunction, uh, which is the which is the 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 the, the uh, in, uh, influ uh, influence uh, uh, affected by the government uh, the uh, court decision. Then uh, that, that's that's based on the you know uh, some uh, that's that's due to the some uh, the you know uh, uh, the court challenge onto the onto the Afrinic and the Afrinic are forced to do some uh, you know uh, not uh, some, some prohibited to do something and then uh, they, uh, currently the Afrinic has the less member of the board uh, board, uh, board of the uh, board of directors then it, it can qualify the quorum. That means that they, they are not, now uh, not, not able to uh, make the decision to appoint someone. That's, that's, the, that's the reason why the, now the, the NRO Adults Council has one, uh, only one uh, the member from the Afrinic, uh, where we, uh, we should employ three, uh, uh, appoint three members for the, for the Afrinic. So uh, these situations are quite serious. And then, uh, actually, the, this this situation is uh, quite uh, concerned uh, by the, the government government people. Uh, some some government officer officer explicitly uh, mentioned their concern to this this situation, and then uh, it is a uh, quite uh, quite serious situation, I think. Then, uh, I, in in the post presentation, we 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 did a great job. Uh, when I when I when we uh, work, worked on the IONA transition, uh, by the IONA transition we finally got uh, got the autonomy uh, from the from the, Jap uh, the U.S. government's over oversight to the to the IONA IONA operation. Now it is it is a quite good process to, for us to uh, uh, for us to uh, obtain the the big trust on our multi-stakeholder. 
uh, private sector-led uh, uh, approach to, to, to operate the Internet Coordination Institute. But uh, that, so at the time, now 2016, we obtained the trust, big trust from the, from the government side. Now it is a little bit questioned, uh, if, uh, if I were to say, so uh, it, uh, for, uh, this is the first point, that we need uh, the robust uh, in, in internet coordination institutions for the future of the internet. Second point is that, uh, you know, the huge public, uh, pu public space within the big tech infrastructure. What uh, does it mean? Uh, it is, uh, you know, we, we are now, uh, you, uh, I, I'm sure you, uh, you, you never fail to use the Google, Facebook, or Amazon uh, web service, or Amazon for the for the for the shopping, and then uh, maybe the the fairly 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 amount of percentage of your internet usage is with this kind of the uh, uh, big tech infrastructure. And then uh, I remember that uh, you know before uh, before big tech uh, before we uh, start, start started relying on uh, the, this kind of the big tech services. We only, only you know, rely on the, for example, internet e emails, or uh, you know, uh, the web, uh, just uh, just browsing the web, or uh, internet relay chat, or uh, net news. They are all without without such a big tech. So that's that's a quite shared uh, generic applications uh, shared by the the internet users. But now we have the, we have the quite a big dependency. Quite a big reliance to the to the big tech infrastructure. Without that, we don't uh, we don't enjoy the the the, uh, the ICT life. Then uh, that that result in a lot of you know public space, meaning the the, the people to interact with the other people, uh, people with, uh, people to uh, you know has a transaction with the, with the company. Uh, such kind of, kind of the public space is just within the big techs. So uh, it is really hard to the, uh, the public sector people to uh, make an influence to the inside of the big tech. That's, uh, that's actually the, uh, you know, uh, the one of the big, uh, big reasons for the various uh, issues, uh, uh, societal problem of the, of the current, uh, current uh, the, you know, information society. We definitely uh, will need some very good way to balance the, you know, uh, uh, take, take the balance of the, the people on the internet, meaning people uh, uh, utilizing the big tech infrastructure uh, and help them to, uh, you know, uh, to be healthy and to be, uh, to be safe, to be uh, protected. So uh, that's the uh, second point. The third point is the internet as the infrastructure for everything. Do you do you think so? Do you agree on that? Uh, internet is now the uh, you know the infrastructure for the everything. Uh, uh, throughout the three-year uh, pandemic period, you, I think you are now capable to work from home. You know that that means that uh, you know infrastructure is the the, uh, the internet is the infrastructure even for the uh, for me to work from work to uh, work for my company, it's it's a quite you know quite a, internet is now the infrastructure of the everyone uh, every every everything, uh, you know it's a quite you know su such kind of the uh, internet serves for the everything uh, more than uh, it 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 was doing before. Then uh, it is it it, it everything everything. Uh, includes the bad thing, uh, good thing, not only a good thing, but uh, also bad thing. For, for example, the one, one of the, the bad example is a war. Uh, for example, we, uh, we have the, the Ukraine and the Russian conflict, but, and then uh, the many people knows, uh, know that uh, uh, we, 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 we have uh, the, the Air Force, Navy, and uh, you know, uh, the Army, um, not only them, but also we have the cyber, uh, cyber force uh, to, to, uh, to do the war. A uh, lo lot of people are, you know, uh, making an attack uh, cyber, uh, in a cyber way. It is how the war is, uh, uh, for, uh, war is happening in, 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 in now. So I mean that 
the, the internet is the infrastructure even for the war. And, you know, uh, not, not, uh, not, uh, not to say that, uh, that uh, uh, you know, uh, to, the, to the war, uh, but uh, we, we have the, a lot of the international conflicts and then uh, features, uh, be, uh, you know, on, uh, happening on the internet. And the interna international conflict should be uh, settled, should be addressed by the international treaty. And then the inter international treaties are not yet uh, as matured as we can, we can uh, so, uh, the, uh, solve the, uh, the, the old problems on, uh, on the international relations. Uh, so uh, inter international relations on the internet is just started. It's like uh, maybe 2015 uh, to set up the really basic uh, principle of the you know, international relationship on the cyber world. So, uh, uh, finally, in, internet is everything, but the, uh, internet, is for the, the internet is the infrastructure for the everything, in, including the in, international conflict, and then we may uh, need to tackle on the quite good, uh, find, finding the quite good way to uh, address a lot of conflict uh, 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 between the countries, and the, so that's, that's the third point. So that we, I, I come up, uh, came up with the three points, uh, mainly for the for my concerns for the future of the internet. Uh, by the way, I have a lot of expectation, lot of the brighter, bright, uh, brighter side of the internet. For example, as as Jeff Houston said, the L L LEO, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, LEO will say, you know uh, serve the entire globe. And then, for example, we, we, can, we can have the, the, the internet sensor in every quarter of the globe, and which, which, we, uh, which will give us a lot of the new uh, knowledge uh, from the quite, quite a good quality of the evidence from the sensor. Uh, sensor. That's uh, really bright. We have, uh, we have a lot of uh, bright uh, future with the future of the internet, but still. We have uh, uh, for for to en for us to enjoy. We need to we need to address the, this kind of the concerns uh, for again the future of the internet and uh, the future happiness of the uh, of us on the internet. That's that's from my side. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. Thank you, Akinori. Uh, basically, uh, just clarification. We didn't provide any compensation to any speaker, so one page should be more than enough. <laughs> Besides, we don't consider we measure the quality instead of quantity, so it'd be fine. So back to today's topics, uh, because I probably some of the audience will question, and you probably anticipate the future of internet will be something like uh, pursuing or recommending some sort of cryptocurrency or, or NFT products you buy or sell. And but instead, we're talking about something quite serious, especially. Uh, the governance issue, and Jeff Houston talking about the infrastructure issue and the future potential future innovation. But back to uh, our core discussion, it seems like uh, uh, we really concerned about the governance governance of the internet and the potential uh, potential impact by the future technology. And in terms of governance of internet, because Paul and Akinori also here mentioned that it's key, the critical importance of the governance of internet. Can you base on this issue and to elaborate a little bit more regarding to what will be potential your, your perspective regarding the, the governance of the internet, starting from Akinori? I, I, I think I told this, that kind of thing in my presentation. <laughs> Kenny, you, you mentioned uh, a couple of times um, very helpfully, helpfully that um, some of the terminology, some of the acronyms or the terminology might be, might be unfamiliar. Um, and if, if that was directed at me, which I think it was, then I, I do apologize. But uh, I thought perhaps uh, if... To Jeff Houston, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> but maybe if, there's, if there are any um, issues that seem to be important that aren't quite clear, then I'd invite any questions about that. Or, Kenny, since you mentioned it, maybe you think there, there might have been some critical uh, issues or acronyms that, or, or, or topics that need a bit more explanation for the, for the audience. Okay. Could be helpful. Probably we still have, still have almost 30 minutes. Uh, okay. I refresh my question again. Uh, 
we're talking about, uh, like Jeff Houston talking about the technology itself, and, but unfortunately I couldn't ask Jeff right now, but anyway, he's mentioned about uh, the potential uh, cell repairing system will be the solution. And, but the question is, the potential cell repairing system that, 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 that take money and that require capital expenditure and operating expenditure as well. And besides, another very critical element for the cyber resilience, because when we, a lot of people talking about uh, internet resilience or cyber resilience, the problem to, to business operator the resilience create, cannot create, cannot differentiate their business model with competitor uh, for, for some times. It's very hard to differentiate. My dif resilience much better than yours. That's one question. And second question is the resilience cannot be a new source of revenue. It just imply a new cost for your business operation. So how can we persuade the business operator willing to put more money on the resilience instead of develop new technology, new product to attract potential new market segment. So if any of you who are interested to respond, so I'm happy to hear. Well, I think the internet is its own worst enemy uh, in this regard because the degree of reliability, uh, dependability is very high. And we see that from the fact that everyone uses it. We, we rely on it. We um, if, if we lose it, then of course it's, it can be a, a, a real problem for individuals. And I, I think about um, COVID and the fact that uh, we started very suddenly the COVID period and we just assumed that, um, that we could suddenly change uh, to work from home, to education from home. And I didn't hear anyone say, well, I hope the internet will cope. I hope the internet can do this. Everyone just assumes that the internet can do this. And they're right, uh, they were right, that's fantastic. But I do know that behind the scenes there, were, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of work that was done more in some locations than in others, but there was a lot of work done to make sure that, that uh, we could cope with increased traffic and in different traffic patterns and so forth. And that was done kind of behind the scenes and mostly in a, in a very problem-free way. So I think the success of the internet hides a lot of the cost, a lot of the um, complexity uh, from, the, from the end user. And I think that's fine for, for consumers. I think consumers deserve that. But I think the business community in particular needs to really understand that their increased reliance, their increased profitability, the, the new opportunities are coming at a cost. And they need, uh, and I do think the society as a whole needs to understand that there's really a phenomenal piece of infrastructure that's being that's being built and delivered almost almost for, for almost for free um, and the the improvements uh, between uh, you know a very very fast response time and a very uh, from a very slow response time might be quite hard to quantify but they are real real improvements and I think also about um, Akinori's mention of the robustness of inter internet institutions and I have to say although um, AP Nick and I'm sure TW Nick we we um, receive quite um, substantial fees from, from our uh, communities. The, the, f the funding for our organisations is substantial and, and I'm always very, very grateful for that uh, because it's, it's a very, uh, very high level of generosity from the, from the community. But, but there's also the fact that in order to cope with increasing complexity, there are increasing costs and I think the... the, um, the uh, robustness of the institutions needs to uh, needs to understand that that as an overhead on the total value of the internet that uh, the cost of the the governance institutions is really low as a, as a total proportion of uh, as an overhead on the, on that cost it's a, it's a tiny proportion and so I, I think we need to have a very um, a long term vision and, a, and an extensive vision of of the importance of technology of standards of of administration of these these governance institutions to really keep the internet uh, to be as stable and as, as successful as we assume it must be um, and 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 understand uh, at least from the business and the planning perspective from the governance perspective what what the realities actually are okay um, I I like the word resilience <laughs> 
before before I joined the, the internet industry, uh, I, I was doing the, the X.25 packet switching. I am the engineer for that. And then uh, there is no word resilience. But redundancy, uh, high quality, that kind of thing. It is, uh, for me, that this, kind, this, this kind of word is so hard, stiff. <laughs> But uh, you know, res resilience is a little bit flexible to to address the the problem. Then uh, you know, the, I I like this word itself and that that you know way of thinking to how to uh, how to make the the the, the whole system uh, more available by resilience. It's a um, really suggestive word. It's uh, not not only the, the increasing the increasing the resource, but uh, uh, we need to devise some good way to uh, to escape from that kind of the the, in the chaos. <laughs> that's 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 my you know understanding of the resilience. So uh, it 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 is what uh, you know what in internet should be so for for me. Then uh, so uh, it is uh, for we for from my that, that kind of point of view that the business players have uh, quite quite uh, you know very good uh, I know what I say fine idea to uh, escape from the, the uh, big, big cost factor to, to realize that the equivalent service to the customer with a cheap price, for example. Then uh, that, 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 that is what I felt from, from your question. Thank you. And I believe many people, when they consider looking forward to the future of the internet or future of cyberspace, uh, many of them probably will prefer to looking for uh, emerging new business opportunity or emerging new innovation of, in terms of technology. But one thing they probably forgot, in this kind of goal searching, basically you are that's a single, that's a single one way directional super highway. And when you go to this way, uh, you probably forgot everything you do based on the, a lot of building block that was made and controlled by someone else. If the building block is very solid, then good luck, please go ahead, search for your opportunity in terms of innovation. And if the building block is unstable and can be crushed, and you're probably the one suffering in the supply chain of the building block. So in terms of, um, no matter Jeff Houston talking about uh, infrastructure resilience and Paul Wilson and Akinori talking about the uh, internet governance. Basically, that will be the very critical component of the building block because the building block is not owned by a single entity. It's owned by the community. If the community didn't engage, didn't participate, especially in the decision process, then eventually you will realize, and we don't need to realize, actually it happened, some of the building block already corrupts, and especially I can mention in some case uh, the election corruption in the AP election, and also something happening in our counterpart, uh, Afrinic. And it happened not only in terms of technology, the building crowd can be hit not only by a shortage of technology, can be hit by probably a business, they run in a business crisis, they probably have uh, some political tension. So that can be easily damaged, that kind of building block. So back to, to the governance itself, I believe that will be a very critical component to ensure that building block that you take for granted should be solid enough for everyone when you're pursuing the future innovation. Oh, I just conclude my observation from your talk. Before I hand over, we have 20 minutes, hand over to the floor. Is any final comment? I'd rather hear to hear. Yeah, hear the hear the, the the voice from the audience. Okay, so open the floor and welcome to to join your comment and your name and affiliation before you speak to the mic. Uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, as I can say, the resilience can be in the many different layer and the many different dimension. And actually, Kenny is uh, during the in the media interview. He keep talking about the uh, submarine cable will be blocked. And unfortunately, he didn't tell more detail about 
when the submarine cable was be broke and what they going to be happen. So it just left say, okay, this is one of the resilient. And now the people sit on the stage, the Kenya, Kenoni, and Po. One is in Taiwan, one is in Japan, one is Australia. You all islands. So the simple way we can think about a couple of things. The first thing, you know, since we are island, so if a submarine cable was to be broke, all of them, in some very bad situation happen. Then we should thinking about what is resilient to us. And resilient is just a, a, a one word, but it can be many different meaning. For example, is uh, you want to resilient back to the ordinary peacetime traffic, or you just only available for emergency traffic. Take an example. I think the people in the Ukraine, I don't think they can enjoy the internet as a peacetime. That should be only for the particularly maybe the military or government usage. If you want to access a Facebook, TikTok, sorry, that is not available because uh, we don't have a traffic, we don't have a bandwidth for you to do that. So when we're talking about resilience, we might be saying how many percentage of the bandwidth we want to offer? 20%? 50% or 80% or as a peace time, 100% and make everybody happy. This is one thing first. How many questions you want to know? <laughs> the second is because of all we are islands. When the summoning cable is broke, then the next question is not only the physical cable issues. Because uh, something cable is uh, broken and in some of the island maybe you have a trouble is uh, the loose server cannot be operated. Right? Because a uh, loose server will be not can be updated. So you need to think about what is resilient to make sure your loose server continue running or your DNS keep running. And if you're in your island, for example, in Japan, maybe the JP you can continue running, but you might be cannot access to the Facebook.com. I don't know if the summoning cable is broke unless you have a middle side or whatever, but the problem is the middle side can be, cannot be updated. So there is, a, there is a, uh, the another layer of uh, we're talking about resilience. So I think uh, when we're talking about resilience, I, I would prefer we are going to talking about more definition about the resilience in what stuff you are talking about. It's a physical layer, or you are talking about, it's a system layer, a DNS layer, application layer. There's a, a lot of things we, we need to think, you know, and hopefully we can identify, you know, in the worst case, which one is the most critical we need to maintain. Okay, thank you. We take uh, two questions together, then we reprioritize response or later on. <laughs> okay. I can have more though. <laughs> yeah. Hi, uh, Edmund Chung here from Dot Asia. Um, I guess everyone talked a little bit about internet governance side. Um, I know um, that was a more technical question. I think. Um, Nicole yesterday talked about that 20 years ago that uh, you know this is a technical issue with a little bit of a political cons consideration but now it's really a political discussion with a little bit of a technical aspect but you 
you know, as, as Chloe asked, and also other, you, you know, you talked about the technical resilience, they're actually equally important, right? Um, so I guess my question really is, uh, especially, uh, uh, Paul, you mentioned that in the next couple of years, it seems like there are critical um, development in terms of the uh, internet governance ecosystem. How do you see that developing? What's, what's that short-term future, actually? And what are the key elements to, to make it continue to be resilient and, and successful? Well, I, I think that's a very good question, and and at APNIC, uh, like many in the tech community, um, like uh, some of the the NIRs or m most or all of the NIRs, and other RIRs, um, a lot of the time we spend these days actually is on trying to build the bridge and maintain the bridge, the bridges. Uh, going back uh, 20 years, I could say that many, if not all, had our heads in the sand. We thought it was just a technical issue that we were dealing with and all we needed to do was do that right and nothing else. And there was actually a lot of, a lot of uh, resistance for cost reason and maybe, maybe also for reasons of our expertise to, to stick to our, the need to stick to our knitting, so to speak, the sort of resistance to going out and, and doing more. But I think those days are long gone. So we spend a lot of our time uh, reaching out, um, I'd call it, um, uh, engagement and to some extent education, uh, making sure that that the actual technical factors, the sorts, the sorts of things we've been discussing in this meeting, are, are well understood and that, that answers can be given. I mean, we, we can't underestimate the challenge and how busy uh, the, the people in the political realm are as well. It's very difficult to, frankly, it's very difficult to get their attention. It's one of the, the benefits I see of, um, of the ICANN structure actually, is that it's a very, um, high-profile forum, which is attracting a lot of a lot of attention, a lot of people with genuine interest um, and roles in in the, that internet governance space and around it, are, they come to ICANN. And so, from APNIC's point of view, we see it as as very a, a very useful place to go, not to talk about DNS issues and not even so much to talk about uh, APNIC technical issues, but to make sure that the that the technology issues and the information about them are, are available. Uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a, a, a concept of not only um, trying to change minds but also equipping our friends and allies to be able to do that as well, the people who really are expert at, at that kind of political negotiation and, and engagement. So it really is important. It's kind of an unpredictable and opportunistic process because there's so much going on. But it's, it's really an important part, I feel, of what we do. And, and to be honest, I think, I think part of the um, increasing... Uh, overhead, the increasing uh, budget and cost of, of the internet institutions, is ex the, the coordinating institutions, uh, technical organisations, is e exactly to do that. And we're quite quite well supported and actually asked by our communities to continue the outreach, to continue that in engagement, to continue to um, to build the bridges. What we see at the moment is is just a lot of change. So the IGF was a was a forum in which we were explicitly welcomed. So the uh, multi-stakeholder forum, technical community, civil society, government, business, academia, everyone is explicitly welcome to go there, and we, and we did go there, and we spent, uh, spent a lot of time. But um, the, the next iterations, if they're not so open, then we've got more of a challenge to try and have voices heard and not to, not to see you know, conversations go on and on and become more and more divorced from that, that technical component such that, like I said yesterday, the technical component becomes smaller and smaller, and suddenly we're 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 nothing but a but a, a football in negotiation, where where internet governance is traded off against a, a wheat deal or a, some other trade negotiation or some other political negotiation, which could potentially be you know really quite uh, detrimental, if not if not disastrous in certain certain scenarios. I'm not trying to be too alarmist about it because I think I think we are um, we are still doing the work. But the work is is uh, is still there and probably getting to be more more of an overhead on on what we do just because of the the inevitable increased cost and attention and dependency on the internet and that's it's a, a, a product of our success I suppose. 
As for, as for Quo's questions, it's sometimes a bit hard to discern your questions from your statements, Quo. <laughs> <laughs> But I think on, on, the, um, on the resilience factor, I think it's the layering of the internet is actually absolutely critical. The layering of the services, the layering of the architecture is critical to being able to, to address those, those, the, problem, the sort of, sorts of resilience problems that you, that you mentioned you know, by the right people with the right expertise in the right place at the right, at the right time. Because you can have a problem at one layer that, doesn't, that, that might impact others, but it doesn't have solutions at those other layers. It simply needs to be fixed at, at that layer. And it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a convenient way to compartmentalise the work and the responsibilities. And it's, it's part of, again, part of the, the robustness, or the resilience of the overall internet is, is to be able to fix problems uh, at the closest point to their, to their sort of source. Thanks. So. You want to weigh in here? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. I can only go. No. That's um, Paul's response is quite uh, deliberate and uh, wise, and then I, I found that you know the, the, the layered approach. Yes, that, that's right. So uh, we have a lot of layers for the uh, for uh, for the uh, realizing the communications from the from the uh, from the layer zero, the somewhere in cable uh, transmission network, and uh, the blah blah blah. And then uh, then uh, then uh, you know the the the, the modern Communications uh, engineering says, uh, including the in internet protocol, of course, it's a it's a layered the the building brought up broke approach that that is a somehow it's vertical but the quite you know uh, the diversity of the the function it's like it's and then uh, trust each other uh, pass pass the communication to the another module and then uh, another another module doing their own job. Uh, yeah, in, in the best job, so uh, that's that's kind of the really you know multi-stakeholder approach of ours. For example, uh, the recent recent uh, the, in a recent discussion, sometimes I, I was uh, I as the JPNIC, uh, may, maybe it's uh, the IP address administrator uh, uh, um, have a, have a question like, uh, is that is the internet can be uh, can, can be sprinted? <laughs> is the internet is a fragment? Uh, can, can be internet? Uh, can be the internet? Uh, can the internet be fragmented? Yeah. I have no idea. I am doing the, the number number uh, IP number management. That's my profession. But uh, I have no idea how to divide the internet. So that's a, that's my answer. So uh, you know, I mean that uh, you know, internet is done by the multi-stakeholder, and the multi-stakeholders have their own respective function and uh, <coughs> empowerment. And then uh, we do the best, uh, the best of our job to that assigned empowerment. That's all. And then the collective stakeholders have uh, got that you know the concerted job. This is the concept of the internet, and then uh, that. That's actually, you know, the your question of the, the cable system failure and the system's uh, availability is, uh, you know, uh, it, it may be uh, quite a similar thing. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I thought you have something to comment. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> well, I think uh, before last year, the Ukraine war, I think the people in the internet community were thought about we are good enough. We are, oh, we have uh, some trouble. We have uh, some financial issue in the FNEC. And is that possible happen in the other institution? But Ukraine will they change a lot. I think most of the people we knew that. And not only in the physical layer, at the same time in the political layer. You know, and usually in the internet community, we don't talk about the geopolitics because we don't think we thought about the multi stakeholder, we thought about button up transparency, we already solved the problem. <clears throat> but to be honest, we know not really true. And this just a take one example. I know that is a back to I don't know I don't remember which year there is an APNIC meeting in the Brisbane, and one of the Chinese uh, technical people come to me, and say, uh, "Go away! Is that possible? If China and the U.S. in war, 
and the U.S. are going to take off the, the CN from the root server. <laughs> How we can survive our internet operation? And by incident, Povix is just right in the Brisbane. <laughs> so, so I just uh, introduced uh, Paul Vixi to meet the guy. And three of, know, three of you know, <coughs> Paul Vixi was being, I should not say higher, he, he helped them to develop in a project called Yachty Project almost more than two years in Beijing and to work it out. If this scenario happened, the China still, the DNS still can in operation. You know, no matter how the CNS disappear from the root server. And so, on the earth, uh, there is uh, many of the different states. And some of the states, they are already ready. And for us, Taiwan, Japan, Australia, we're still thinking about trying to maintain the old, lovely internet, peaceful, continuing, but we are not as China so critical to thinking about what the situation when that happened. Until the Ukraine war, and at the same time, until the Kenny Huang was interviewed by Wall Street Journal, he mentioned about the ocean cable broke. And unfortunately, is, uh, when he talking about that, but, uh, but not many people really doing the research about the scenario when the submarine cable is broke, how many layers will be impact, how we can do it. <coughs> and <coughs> this is uh, one of the reasons I, 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 I try to raise uh, in here when the people began to talk about resilience. And then back to the institution we all knew, such as IGF, such as ICANN, such as IR, uh, such as those of the important institutions continue to maintain and base on, as we know, I can only you are the board member of ICANN, I was too, and we kind of try to have a government arise committee and involved by the government or something like that. But I think you heard that. I think this year, last year, the UN tried to think it about again, about the internet institution, how to link with the UN system. And I think Paul and I, I think Paul, you were in the, in, in the early day of the uh, uh, WISIS, 2003 and 2005. We fight so hard to keep the internet institution independence. If you remember in the 2005, the Wiggers lay out a four different model and try to put the ICANN or IR under the UN structures. And with a lot of people help, we still can maintain independence. But somehow last year they began to bring this issue back again. And for me, I thinking about, wow, the two, 2003, 2005 fighting is coming back again. I think, Paul, you are in the APNIC, I think you knew that, you know, have some kind of feeling, you know. And particularly, 2023 today is very different to 2003, 2005 at the time, because uh, we knew that in the 2003, Paul and uh, you and me, we are in the Geneva recess. A lot of government delegates doesn't even never heard the name of the internet, right? 
Somebody delegate raised their hand as the chair. What we are talking about, what we are doing here? <laughs> and eventually they need a wigas to help them to write a background report to tell them what kind of issue we want to deal with. Because at the time, it's only 3% of the population, world population, is on the net. Today is very different. The government, they might be, they still doesn't know, but they know the internet is so critical for them. And it's under their territory. They want to govern, governance. So I think this, the, 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 the situation is changing. So that is a, another layer of the resilience we want to talk about is in a political issue, how we solve that. Okay, thank you for the final comment. Uh, actually, all the time has already been running out by Guowei. <laughs> so we don't have any additional time to feedback. But, uh, it is quite <laughs> impressive. Yes, uh, we need to realize that this is the, 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 the this is Geneva phase plus 20. That's a good, good, rem good reminder. Okay, thank you. It seems that it's a Guowei's comment. It seems that we cover everything for today. And that concludes our discussion for this section. And before I conclude the meeting of June, can we give a big hand to our panelists? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your participation. And see you in 20 minutes. I'll go back to, to the MC today. Sorry. Thank you very much, Dr. Huang, for moderating the session. And thank you to Mr. Maya Mura and Mr. Wilson for sharing with us your insights. We would like to invite everyone to please come to the front for a group photo. Thank you. Please look at the photographer in the middle and the big smile. Thank you. Thumbs up for the photo. Thank you, thank you very much.